there's a common denominator that I can share. There's an emphatic piece of information that I can share. You are never, ever going to outrun your fear. It'll catch up with you and it'll knock you down if you don't deal with it. My question is, why do you need that certainty? Does that make you feel more comfortable taking a step into the unknown? The fact of the matter is there's no way to avoid that feeling of terror. People say, oh, I'm waiting for confidence or I'm waiting till I feel better about myself. That's never going to come. You don't get confidence before you start something. You get confidence in the process of doing something and the successful repetition of any endeavor that you undertake. That's when the confidence comes. On today's show, we talk about how the world's most creative people go about creating their lives with the one and only Debbie Millman. You are, of course, a designer first. You're the host of the Design Matters podcast. It's been going for, for, I mean, I'm going to say close to two decades. We're not there yet. But you've also been named one of the most creative people in business. And it seems like your mission these days is to is to connect with the world's most creative people to see how they create their lives. And that so the is question, exactly right. <laughs> the, the question I have for you is, what makes the group of people that you connect with and speak to different? That's great. Question mark. Um, I think that the difference between the people that I speak to or, or people that are able to achieve greatness through their creativity is that they believe they have something important to say. Is this something that, that you think just like bubbles throughout them and they just they, they have a confidence that comes where it's like, what I have to say, what I have to create, what I have to put out into the world has to be shared because they just can't help themselves? Or is this something that's kind of developed over time? Well, I don't know that there's necessarily one answer to that question. I think that people approach their creativity and their ability to make things in very, very different ways. They have different motivations. I do think indeed some people are just bursting at the seams with their ideas and inspiration and are likely well-parented and feel like whatever they are making has value and worth and, and just want to share. And that sense of abundance and joy is apparent in probably everything that they do. And then I think there are other people that are really driven because they're trying to prove themselves because maybe they haven't been as well-parented or because they've had some sort of trauma that they're working through. So I, I think that for every person that makes something, there's probably a slightly different motivation, although there's likely some common denominators, but I don't know that there's any one other than the only common denominator that I could point to would just be the desire to make things from nothing, which is a pretty profound thing to want to do, whatever the motivation and now when you talk about the scale of, of those who may have come from, you know, a family of origin that lifted them up or someone with something to prove, what was it that drew you to design? Well, I came to design quite by accident. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a career in design. <laughs> I went to college and got a degree in English literature and Russian literature and English translation. And so I joke now that I have a college degree in reading. Um, but while I was in college, I started working at the school newspaper and then thought, hmm, this, this newspaper thing is super cool and really interesting. And maybe I'll pursue that as a career as I really didn't have a sense of what I could do or who I could be. And because I had this skill that I had acquired working on the student newspaper in old school, basic layout and design, paste up and all of that, that was the skill that ultimately allowed me to get a job. So the design career was more of a default career in that I wanted to do something creative, but I also was in a position where I had to take care of myself and had lived for so many years in a state of anxiety and stress as I was growing up about where I was going to live and who I was living with and how I was being parented and so forth that I really put security and safety in that same bucket of, of need 
as I did creativity. And so commercial art became a way for me to do that. Who knows what I might have done if I had been in that situation where I was brought up thinking that everything I did was amazing. <laughs> and then and then I would have had a probably different career, but I'm I'm in the Dan Gilbert um category of happiness believers and think that I can synthesize happiness as much as I can have it organically. And do you think that, I mean, you just touched on a point where you were placing comfort, security, you know, if we're, if we're working through some, some of the human needs here is, is creativity or the, the act of creating really reserved for those who have gotten some of these other basic needs out of the way? I don't know about that. I, no. I don't think so. What do you think? I mean, do you think that they, they are, that they getting those basic needs out of the way is necessary? Well, I don't, I don't know because I, I've often said of myself and I, I have anxiety and I've often said, you know, like anxiety is, is kind of reserved for people who have the luxury of time to focus their energy on it. You know, if you're, mm. if you're really, if you're really scraping to get by and you're just working and you're just hustling, or if you find yourself in a situation, I grew up in a very abusive home. I know that you grew up in an abusive home as well. When, when you grew up in these pressure cooker environments, you don't have the, the luxury perhaps to be depressed or you don't have the luxury to allow time. And and I almost see, and I think this might be a problem. I think in, in Western society, we see creativity as a luxury reserved for those who have the time to get around to it. Well, I, I think that there's a part of me that does understand what you're saying and believes in, in this point of view. However, as I was growing up, I didn't know there was such a thing as depression. I didn't know that what was happening to me was actually happening to hundreds of thousands of kids all over the world. I thought it was, you know, I had never heard of sexual abuse. I had never heard of physical abuse. It wasn't something that I saw the neighbors engaging in or heard about through my friends. This was something that was so foreign to me when it started that I actually thought I was the only person in the world it was happening to. It was that much outside of what I thought was possible in the world. And so I did have a lot of anxiety. I didn't know at the time that what was happening to me was manifesting in these behaviors. You know, I ended up with a really bizarre sort of speech impediment for a year, became very withdrawn. All of those things are classic depression signifiers, but nobody recognized those either. I did take quite a lot of solace in making things, in writing in starting a diary, in drawing. And even though a lot of these really terrible things were happening, I still tried to make things wherever I could. My stepfather had two daughters. So suddenly I went from having just a brother to now three siblings. And, and I, I was still trying to direct plays and make things and, you know, and force them to be, you know, in my plays that I was making and I was writing songs and we were all singing them and I was decorating the living room with, to make it into a set. And, you know, I, I vividly, vividly remember these things. So I think that for me at the time, creativity probably saved me. Reading saved me. I became a voracious reader. And that was both in the enjoyment of reading, but also I think in the escape that reading gave me. You mentioned something a little bit earlier about anxiety as well. And uh, I, there's a comedian I love named Jimmy Carr uh, out, of, out of the UK. Uh, I don't recommend comedy to anyone because it's very, very based on tastes. He says something- you know, <laughs> I love comedy. <laughs> well, he is inappropriate to say the least. But, but um, w something he said in, in a book that he released in September, which I found interesting, is that he kind of believed that, that there's a certain stress or pressure or anxiety that's kind of required, that, that comes with the act of creating and being creative. And if you don't want that stress or anxiety or pressure, chances are you're not going to you're not going to have whatever it takes to bring and birth into the world this new thing that you're doing. See, I disagree with that. I disagree okay. with that. I saw Elizabeth Gilbert speak a couple of years ago, and she was talking about the state that she needs to be in to actually make her best work. And it really impacted me. She talked about how she needed to be relaxed and it suddenly occurred to me, I could then identify when I like the work that I'm making versus not. 
And that doesn't mean I'm going to like it forever, but while I'm making it, if I'm in a state of anxiety, I find that my work is much more tortured. Whereas if I am relaxed, my lines are freer, my, my way of approaching whatever medium I'm using, whether it be colored pencils or oil sticks or my iPad and Apple pencil, all of those things, everything happens much more easily if I'm coming to it in a state of real engagement. And so I think that stress might motivate ideas, but I think that the practice itself, at least for me, the physical practice of either writing or drawing or making something tends to be a bit easier when I'm relaxed. And so do you, are you able to put yourself into a state of flow on demand no. or no? So, <laughs> so because, because this is interesting when, when I've owned a creative agency for 15 years and I used to tell junior editors who'd come in, they'd be handed hours of footage and some editors, some storytellers kind of have to feel it in order to be able to produce. And I think artists are that way. Creatives are that way. You have to feel it to produce, but if you are committing to do this for a job all day, every day, you, you don't have the luxury of waiting to feel like it. Like we have, yeah. we have output we need to do. We have production Absolutely. we need to do. Yeah. Yep. And so are you, so, so how do you, or even those, I mean, you've spoken to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and, and just on the podcast, let alone the thousands of people you've networked with. Is there, is there a real great way to be able to get yourself to the place without having to wait for the inspiration to come to you? I don't know. I think for me, walking helps. Sometimes I have to work through the torture to get to the relaxed state. That's happened sometimes too, where I just sort of give up. And in that moment of surrender, something else begins to bubble up, but that's not something I would recommend because that torture can be really painful. painful. (laughs) (laughs) I remember one time working on a piece and when I was working on Look Both Ways, it was my first book of illustrated essays. And I had an idea that I wanted to do for one of the essays. And I was working all all weekend long on this one thing that just felt really tortured. And it was the middle of February and I was doing something with some Sharpies or I needed some Sharpies and I didn't have any Sharpies in the house that were working properly. And it was midnight on Sunday night and I had been working all weekend and I decided to go to a 24 hour store near my house. And I trudged out my boots with the snow and I'm like looking for Sharpies And I get back and it's one o'clock in the morning and I'm trying again. And then all of a sudden I had this moment of inspiration, literally threw everything out that I had been working on all weekend. And in about 20 minutes was able to sketch something that I really liked. I don't recommend that. (laughs) That That was not the way I like to approach work. I was really, really happy with what came out. Um, and that feeling of breakthrough was palpable, but that was a tough weekend. <laughs> it was a tough weekend. Did you just have a deadline or like, did you have to not have the luxury of, I find sleeping on it helps. I know uh, Aaron Sorkin, like literally will take a shower and change his clothes like <laughs> like 12 times a day if he has to write, but were you just up against the clock or why, why push? Yeah, through that? I was, I was, I was on a deadline with the book and I had wanted really badly to make something special for this one particular piece. Um, It was based on an encounter that I had at the New York Public Library seeing an opera by Myra Kalman and Nico Muley. And I really just felt like it needed to express something special visually as well as verbally. And Myra is a hero of mine. And I just felt like it in, in, in respect to her, I wanted it to be special. It was also one of the essays that was opening the book. And so I felt like the introduction to this book needed to be something that really captured the imagination of whoever was reading it. And now your, your new book, Why Design Matters, is of course based on your, your wildly popular podcast where you're able to really deep dive with all of these creatives, but also it's not just creatives, it's not just artists, but it's a whole collection of people. And so if you kind of reflect back, and I apologize if this is a a lazy question, but what are the similarities that almost caught you off guard in terms of the way that that those you've connected with 
think or even the, the things that come naturally to them or the things that they avoid? Well, I don't know that I've ever asked anybody what they avoid. What struck me was how, no matter how successful they are, they're still really hungry. They're still really working hard. The work ethic that the people that I've spoken to exhibit is breathtaking and and how much they commit to their work and how much they commit to their practice and their creativity. That's That's been really an extraordinary thing to witness. And one of the reasons that I've enjoyed being able to do the podcast when I could pre-COVID with my students as an audience was that I think they were able to understand what creative excellence requires, the kind of dedication, the kind of sacrifice you're often making to do something really extraordinary. And so I didn't have to browbeat them to get them to work harder than everybody else, which is one of the things that I tell them to do. Um, They could see that that is really what is required in order to make something meaningful, in order to make something exceptional. So that's definitely a a through line. Um, I I was really- To to sit on that for a second, do you think greatness can be achieved without that level of, I mean, we all all look at these people, but regardless of what you commit your life to, you almost need that kind of hardcore dedication to to kind of break through to greatness on any level, no? And I think that there are the virtuosos, there are the people that, that are able to make concertos, you know, when they're four years old, but- I don't know anybody like that. Well, no, that's not true. I would say maybe Nico Muley. He, he, speaking of of operas, um, he was able to do things quite extraordinary from a very, very young age. But that's the exception. It's definitely not the rule. Um, so I think that I'm I'm very much in the Malcolm Gladwell ten thousand hours. I would even say that for many people it might require more. I think ten thousand is the entry point, the table stakes, and then from there you can continue to grow and develop and maybe have something original. Unless you're super super lucky, maybe you're born genetically, you know, like Michael Phelps. You know, you're born genetically with genetic advantages that others might not have. But that doesn't take away from the hours, the focus, the work, right. the dedication. Absolutely, like, absolutely. Know, he's got he's got the long arms, but but yeah. that just it's it's a bit like you know if, if we're speaking about I believe it was Gladwell who was talking about you know the, in I think Outliers where he mentions um, about people born early in the year happen to have the advantage of being slightly older and then they're slightly larger and then we see these things and so um, I almost wonder about these virtuosos whether there was there was just an inkling of something that was so nurtured and so developed and, 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 and almost impressed upon them early on that, that it seems that way when in fact reality, anyone who dedicated themselves with the belief and the confidence that it would happen would achieve the same results. A lot of the questions you're asking me are hard for me to answer because I don't know that there's one way. Ah. And I don't know that anything that I say or feel or do is going to mean that somebody else should do it exactly the same way or think that that is an advantageous way for them. Because I I don't know enough about the way in which a person lives and breathes and desires and hopes to be able to say, oh, you should do this, you should do that. It's hard enough with students that are under my care but at least I, I get to know them before I can make recommendations on who should mentor them or where they should apply for a job or whatever. But when I'm talking to an audience of people that I've never met, I, I find it really dangerous to say. You're so prescribed. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when when my, when I wrote my first book, How to Think Like a Great Graphic Designer, I was I was mortified by the title, How to Think Like a Great Graphic Designer. I wasn't. I didn't go to the publisher with this idea and try to sell the book. I was approached by a publisher who Steve Heller had recommended to me. And here comes my kitty. Um, and, and they had this book that they wanted to publish about this idea of, of thinking like a great graphic designer. And he said, no, but call Debbie Millman. Maybe she'd want to do it. And when... <laughs> <laughs> I love it for those listening in. That, that's Debbie's cat. <laughs> <laughs> I was away for a while and now I'm back. And so he's very, very cuddly and, and purry. Um, so in any case, 
I I didn't really want to write a book called How to Think Like a Great Graphic Designer because I was absolutely appalled at the idea that there could be one way that all great graphic designers think. But at the time, back in 2007, when, when I was first offered the opportunity, I was in a in a state of mind and had been for most of my life till that point of this is the only opportunity I'm ever going to get. So I have to say yes. And so they came to me with this book idea. I had never published a book before. I really wanted to publish a book. It was a huge dream of mine. Steve had recommended me. And so I said, yes, but (laughs) ask them rather than coming up with a prescribed way that great graphic designers think, because I had already started interviewing people. My podcast at that point was about two years old. I asked if I could interview some of the world's greatest graphic designers in an effort to reveal how they individually think and approach their creativity. And luckily for me, the the publisher said yes. And, and that was the book that I wrote. So how to think like a great graphic designer became sort of tongue in cheek. That still doesn't mean that people get mad at me on Amazon because they think the book is about how to think like a great graphic designer and will write comments in in the reviews like, I thought this was a book about how to think like a great graphic designer. It's just a book of interviews. (laughs) You touched on such a key point here. When you tell your students or when the the Amazon reviewers want the answer and your students yeah. want the answer and the people who come to you like me you know i'm i'm putting i'm putting you on the spot because my hope is to be able to get those amazing tactical pieces of advice where we could just unlock and go but when when people are find out that there is no right and there is no wrong do they see this as incredibly freeing or do they see it as almost a sign of hopelessness because it's like then what? Well, I don't think I'm shutting anybody down when I don't have prescribed recommendations. My my question to somebody that's looking for certainty is why do you need that certainty? Does that make you feel more comfortable taking a step into the unknown? The fact of the matter is there's no way to avoid that feeling of terror when you are starting something new that means something to you. And you know, when people say, oh, I'm waiting for confidence or I'm waiting till I feel better about myself, that's never going to come. You don't get confidence before you start something. You get confidence in the process of doing something and the successful repetition of any endeavor that you undertake. That's when the confidence comes. And so, you know, humans have a genetic predisposition to avoid anything uncertain or anything that's going to make them feel vulnerable or unsafe. That's just the in the oldest part of our brain. We can't control that any more than we could control the adrenaline surge we might feel if we're about to get hit by a bicycle, you know, and that, that sense of urgency and getting out of the way. We don't will that to happen. We experience that. And the same thing happens when we're approaching something or thinking about something, or attempting to do something that we haven't done before. We're not born really knowing how to do anything. We have a lot of abilities that grow and develop as we grow and develop. We learn how to talk. If we're able-bodied, we learn how to walk. But these are all learned things. And, you know, we don't even, we're not even able to sort of poop in a respectable way when we're babies. So why should we think that anything that we try to do over the course of our lives is somehow, it's prescribed in a way that is going to avoid any struggle or is going to avoid any um, sense of judgment or shame or humiliation or rejection or failure. All of those things are just part of the experience of, of being human. And if we try to iron out the sense of fear that we experience when looking into the unknown, we cut off a part of ourselves that is fundamental to who we are. I think we have to step into that fear and step into that unknown in an effort to experiment with seeing that even if we do fail, we are likely going to recover. Humans metabolize every emotion pretty quickly. The one the one thing we don't really metabolize well is regret because there's no closure to regret. And so, you know, if you think back, I mentioned Dan Gilbert before, and I love his very old TED talk called The, Surpri- the Secret Surprise About Happiness or something like that. But it's from, I think it's from 2004. 
And he talks about how we anticipate our futures in very um, overblown ways, both the good and the bad. And he talks about organic happiness, which is what you feel when you get what you seek getting. When you, you go after something, you get it, you have organic happiness. And then if you go after something and you don't get it, you, you, the human brain tends to be able to synthesize some other thing that we want, and then we can achieve happiness in getting that. So you can go after what you want and get happiness. You can go after what you want, not get it, synthesize some other opportunity for yourself, and then have synthesized happiness. The only way to really be miserable is to not go after what you want. Most people struggle to know what they want. I, I was at I was an event with uh, my friend Evan Carmichael, 2018. We're at a Tony Robbins event. We're in the front row. Uh, I was I was invited through him through Tony or whatever. We're we're in the special section with all wow, of the actors. It's so and cool. The, it was. <laughs> I know Tim Ferriss did that too. I want to do that. <laughs> it was it was very cool because I was working with uh, you know some Olympic gold medalists and some actors and all of these people. And then one guy just we're working through this pro- process and he just interrupts me and he's like, Mark, you don't know what you want. I was like, no, no, no. And he's like, Mark, you don't know what you want. And it stuck with me. And then I realized that was 2018. It's 2022. <laughs> I still really struggle to, to, to actually articulate and synthesize what I want. Is it what because you're I... afraid to admit it to yourself? Uh, I, I feel like it limits my options. To be that simple, to, be, to, to really get to the point of it being so simple that there's clarity, it feels like... I, I want to touch everything. I want to taste everything. I don't want to, I want to be great. But the thought of being great at one thing, which I know is the answer. And, and even earlier on, you said how hard these people work and how much they dedicate themselves to the 10,000 hours in the craft. It feels like I'm giving up so much. And yet I watch myself do half of things or, or, or hit levels of mediocrity that I'm not happy with on many things rather than just focus on one. I've always liked doing a lot of different things. It was very hard for me, even in high school, to just pick one or two things. I was on the track team. I was the boys varsity basketball manager. I was on the honor society. I was in pop chorus. I was in, I was voted class dramatist. Um, I was, I, I loved doing a lot of different things. And that pattern has continued throughout my entire life. When I was in college, same thing. When I now as an adult over the years, I've always enjoyed writing, art, business, um, podcasting, (laughs) managing, uh, running a magazine. There's so many things that I've loved doing. And I think that to expect mastery when you are segmenting your life into various paths it's still possible. It just takes a lot longer. So instead of the 10,000 hours, it might take 70,000 hours. So instead of becoming great at something when you're 40, you might have to wait until you're 60. But I think ultimately you are much more content because you're still doing all the things that you want to be doing and growing and evolving and becoming um, better at them the more you do them. So I wouldn't suggest to anybody to just pick one thing. I think that the more things you do, the more they cross pollinate with other things. And if you have that kind of multiplicity in your curiosity, that it just makes you a more fulfilled person as you're doing these things. Yeah. Well, part of me feels like I'm doing it the wrong way. And then the other part of me goes, I don't know how to do it any other way. And uh, so there's just that, that, that tension that kind of exists for myself. I, I've heard you. I've heard you speak on other podcasts and in other interviews where you talked about all of these different things that you've touched and you've tried and you've along the way. Were you always comfortable with how long things took, or would you beat yourself up for the fact that it's like, well, I should have, you know, be early. I should be further along in my career, or I, I should be doing this, or I should be doing that. Or were you able to get through that? I've always had a lot of self doubt. And I've always questioned my motivations and my ability, and I still do, maybe not quite as intensely as I did in the past, but I'm still always questioning my value and my worth and my ability to do anything. So, And I think people who listen to you would, would, would hear that and recognize that, but people who have watched your career or even looked at your, your bio or even picked up your books or went to Wikipedia would say, how is that even possible? How is, how is, how is such a female leader in this space? How is someone who has been able to do so much and produce so much and 
have you know such a rich life have all of those doubts? Why do they have to be separate? And anybody that thinks they can't have both, I think is holding themselves back. I I really was impatient in in my career. In my 20s, the entire decade of my 20s, I now look back on and have called my decade of experiments and rejection and failure because everything I tried, I I failed at. I I tried to go to grad school. I tried to go to to get a a master's degree in in journalism from Columbia School of Journalism. I was rejected. I applied to the Whitney Independent Study MFA program. I was rejected. Um, I had a whole slew of different jobs, wasn't getting anywhere. Um, finally, when I did start my own business, I was embarrassed about what we were making and producing. So I think that it really wasn't until my mid forties that I started to really get a sense of what I was capable of doing and began to understand some of the motivations and what I enjoyed and why I enjoyed it. So I think that you can have extraordinary self-doubt, but still make really interesting things. You know, one of the things that I've talked about before that I think is is worth repeating is how Barbara Streisand manages through her debilitating stage fright. There was a great article in New Yorker a couple of years ago about stage fright and how people manage to work through or not their, their stage fright. And her manager was interviewed and said her great talent isn't acting or singing or directing or any of the multiple amazing things she does that she has gotten every single award there is to get in the performing arts. Her great talent is doing all of those things with debilitating stage fright. Apparently, when she was very young, I think before she was even 20, she did a concert at Central Park and forgot some of the words to her songs and was mortified and humiliated and didn't want to perform live ever again. And then I guess 30 or so years later, she began to think about doing that again. I saw her at Madison Square Garden, and it was an extraordinary concert, live concert. But then when I saw her at Barclays Center, and this was the most recent concert tour, I went by myself. Nobody else wanted to go with me. And I went by myself. And because I was by myself, I was just doing a lot more observing. You know, I wasn't talking. I wasn't like swooning with a friend. I was just sort of watching and lurking and observing and experiencing. And at one point I look all the way, I looked up for whatever reason, and I could see at the very, very top nestled among the wires and the lights of the Barclay Center was a teleprompter. And the teleprompter had all the words to all the songs going on as she was singing. Now, Mark, I could have gotten up on that stage and sang Stony End without a teleprompter or yeah. The Way We Were without a teleprompter. But the fact that she had had hacked into her stage fright in a way that allowed her to still perform while still experiencing what she was experiencing really showed me, like, if Barbara Streisand still scared about something, then, you know, what the fuck hope is there for the rest of us? And yet she was able to figure out a way to still simultaneously hold that fear, which was prompting the need for a teleprompter, but still do it anyway. And that's, I think, the best example that I could give of someone holding these multiple personalities, so to speak. She's still scared, but she still wants to perform. And so therefore, she's figured out a way to do that. And I think that anybody can try to get around the fear, but they're never going to do it. It's always going to catch up. Always, always, always. That I can tell. There's a common denominator that I can share. There's an emphatic piece of information that I can share. You are never, ever going to outrun your fear. It'll catch up with you and it'll knock you down if you don't deal with it. So face it, face it head on and figure out a way to work with it or through it but you're never going to work around it ever. That's so amazing. My, my, Barbara Streisand is one of my aunt's favorite artists. She has seen her on every single one of her retirement tours <laughs> that, she's, <laughs> that she's done. Well, now that there's the teleprompters, you know, she'll probably be doing more. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's funny because what is so... My wife loves the artist Pink and Pink released mm. her live, stu- her live uh, concert uh, documentary and her live album. And in that album, while she's at, I think she's in Wembley, I think she's in front of like, you know, tens of thousands of people. She completely forgets her lines, completely forgets it. Now I know how studio, I know how live albums are recorded. They record night after night after night. 
They'll do two, three, four nights. They wear the exact same stuff and then they pick the best of the best. So the fact that she released the single, the song of her forgetting her lines, being embarrassed, saying, guys, this song is too important. We got to do this again. And then starting again, I turned to my wife and I was like, there's no reason that they had to do that, except it is so endearing. I, I love the courage it shows to be able to not only make the mistake, but then not try to bury the mistake, to be able to embrace it and to own it and to be able to move on. Have you found in your experience or even those that you're speaking to, can we get more comfortable owning our mistakes and, 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 and being able to have them be a part of our, of our story in such a way that it's not something we have to just kind of push aside? Absolutely. And I think that the first step is to not think of them as mistakes, but just think of it as an evolution in, in the way that you are making things. As, as for Pink, I think it shows just a, an incredible humanity. It reminds me of the time I was interviewing Marina Abramovich, and I was so nervous, Mark. And when I started, I flubbed my intro. Why, why were you so nervous? Just Just because of... Because she's Marina Abramovich, you know, one of the world's greatest performing artists. She was, she, you know, think about the piece that she did at MoMA, you know, what was it, three, four, five years ago, um, where she sat and were, was just looking at people eight hours a day. She has this incredibly magnetic, see through you stare. And there she was, two feet away from me, sitting across from me, one of the most important performing art, performance artists of our time. I'm a huge fan of hers. And I started my intro and I flubbed and she took it as an opportunity to say, okay, stop. Okay. Breathe, breathe. And when we did this like whole breathing exercise together and my producer loved it so much, he's like, oh, we have to put that up. We have to include this in the interview. And I was like, Okay. And I've gotten so many notes about that particular experience that how, how people could relate to being in front of their hero and just being like such a fangirl that I could barely speak anymore. And, and they loved it. So, and, and I love it too. Now, I think that if we try to avoid making mistakes, we get really tense in our bodies and that, I think, holds us back. I mean, think about an athlete. An athlete has to warm up all their muscles. They have to be able to have relaxed enough, warm enough muscles to be able to do anything. And I think that's the same way with any activity. So I think if we hide, try to hide our mistakes or avoid mistakes, we're living in this state of, of shame about the mistakes. And shame really only can flourish in hiding. There is no shame when it's out. You might be a little embarrassed. You might wish it didn't happen, but I don't know that it's something that people are going to leave you for if, if it's something that they can relate to. So I, I feel like the more people can talk about the things that they struggle with, the more other people will likely relate to them because we all experience this. And so why pretend otherwise? I love that. When I had James Altucher on the podcast, I like like with you when I when we kicked it off, I you know I asked, hey, you know, this is who I am and this is what we do. And with James, he was a little bit late and he was just getting his mic set up. And I, I just out of the blue, I was like, I'm Mark, just so you know. And I said it like that. He said, I know who you are. And I went, oh. And then he literally jumped on that. He's like, why are you so surprised? Like, let's talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was not prepared to start off the interview by talking about my insecurities, but one of my favorite podcast kickoffs because you just didn't know where it went. Yeah. I mean, I don't think people, you know, nobody ever goes to Instagram now and scrolls for a half an hour and comes away feeling really good about themselves because people are just projecting their best self or their best moment or what they want other people to think about themselves People really respond to other people when they share what's meaningful and true and deep and sometimes not as pretty as they'd like it to be. But that humanity is something that is what connects us. Yeah. And now, you're, you're, again, your book, Why Design Matters, is uh, a collection of uh, some of the, the most thoughtful people you've had on your podcast with the lessons learned paired with remarkable photography just to help capture their spirit and their soul. Uh, now, 
as you've kind of produced this book, I've, again, I've heard you say, I like to create stuff and then I, I kind of move on. But what does this book mean to you? Well, I sort of see it now as a bit of a monograph, which I never really thought my branding work deserved. So to have a monograph now of this body of work is something that I'm really proud of. And, and because I didn't really approach the book in that manner, and I only realized it as I was finishing it, that, gee, this is, this is like a body of work. This is a monograph of, of, my, of my podcast. I got really excited and, and really happy that I was able to do this. I wasn't planning on doing a book early on when I was doing the podcast. I would say in the first five or six years, people asked me if I would do a book or was going to do a book. And I, I spoke to a very dear friend of mine who has a lot of experience in, in, in that world. And he was like, why, you know, it's for free on the internet. Why, why would you expect people to pay to, to read what they could hear for free? And, and he was right at the time. I wouldn't have approached the book in this way, but my agent really urged me to consider doing it in, in a way that was able to capture the sort of innate sense of, of who these people were and how they approached their creativity in a way that was different from the podcast because they would be really well edited and curated. And I, I didn't include any entire essay, I'm sorry, any entire interview, um, because the interviews go on for so long, I could have included maybe eight interviews in, in a book that was the same size it is now. I had to be able to extract pieces that still felt like they could live on their own. But thank you for noticing the photography. Um, I was supposed to do a photo shoot. I was going to go on this sort of national photo shoot and take photos of the guests that I was including. And then COVID hit and I couldn't do that. And I wasn't going to do something where I was directing people through the screen. And so I ended up doing all the photo editing and contacting some of the world's greatest photographers to be able to include photos of each of the guests that I was featuring. Um, and the criteria for those photos was that I needed to see the soul in their eyes. And that was the connective thread that was going to pull everything together. So thank you for noticing that. <laughs> well, we run into this, if, if, if we're talking about just process here, there's this always this desire, this, this creative ideation or desire of what could be. And so you picture in your head, you know, I, I, I picture this being this way. And then something happens, you know, like, yes, we could go out to all of the different people and set up all the different foot shoots and have it all be the same. Oh, we can't go out now. So what do we do? Well, we can rely on licensing different photos or we can try and collect stuff. But, but then there's just no continuity between the stuff. Right. And, and if you're not a creative, you might say, well, what does that matter? Right. Like, like it's just a photo, but, but, but you wanted it to have the soul or the essence. You wanted it to, to feel a certain way, to, to, to create a certain atmosphere. And, yeah. and that's something that I feel and, and I, I feel is important that if you're, if you don't think maybe like you or I, then, then maybe it's just not that important. Maybe it's just more about you know, dollars and cents or brass tacks or just, you know, nuts no, and bolts. No, no. Like, it's just like, no. like I need a book, um, you know, take some transcripts, take some photos, slap it together. Away we go. I think anyone who's on the more engineering or tactical or action focused side would think that, that spending that much time, that much care, that much money is, doesn't, doesn't, mean anything. Well, but, but it, I definitely, but it does to you, right? Oh, it absolutely. I mean, I, I spent every penny of my advance on editing and photo rights and design and, and it was worth every penny. I wouldn't do it any other way. Sure. I would have liked to have kept a little bit in my pocket, but it was much more important to me to have something that I would be really proud of. I didn't want to publish a book with even one photograph that I didn't love. And there were two people at the very end that I was still waiting for better photography from. Um, I didn't like the photo. I mean, I, I liked the photo that Elizabeth Alexander submitted, but it was a very professional photo. It's a photo that, that is on the Mellon Foundation website and it's a beautiful photo, but it didn't have the sort of tactile quality that I wanted. And then I found one and I still needed to get her permission and wasn't able to reach her. And so reached out to my friend, Maria Popova, who was good friends with her. And I'm like, please text her, get her to, please get her to respond. And then finally she did. Um, and then Oliver Jeffers, for whatever reason, all of the photos that I loved weren't big enough for a 10 by 10 book. And literally I had like one last day, I'm like Oliver, 
I can't use any of these photos. So he conducted an entire photo shoot for me to be able to give me a photo. And that's the photo that's in the book. So it was stressful, very stressful at the end, (laughs) but it was worth it. But I've always seen, you know, putting that much care, that much time, that much effort as a gift to not only the readers or the people who who are going to, you're creating an environment or an atmosphere that, that you're bringing them into, a world you're bringing them into, but it's also a gift for those who are included because you spent this time, you spent this care, and and you've kind of elevated the entire feel and the entire look. Now, I'm almost touching on just the core of branding or the core of design or what have you, but but I, I see taking the time, the care, and the energy as, as a gift that that you're giving everyone. Do you, do you see it the same way? I'd like to. I, I'd like to think that. Absolutely. You know, I'm just hoping people like it. I wanted to make something that, and and, and this will be sort of an interesting symmetry to the conversation, um, that I wouldn't have any regrets over. You know, I was not going to skimp on anything because I didn't want to look back and think, oh, I regret not pushing for that one extra thing that I wanted. <laughs>